Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm here to talk to you about the subject I'm most passionate about, which is families. But I'm not going to talk about family values or if families are getting stronger or if they're in decline or my personal opinion about same-sex marriage. I'm here as a cultural anthropologist, and I'm going to talk to you about the institution of family and how it's changing in the United States and across the world. My interest in families has always been there. As I was preparing for this talk, I remembered that in ninth grade, you know when you write your first term paper, you're learning how to put together a bibliography? My very first paper was on the generation gap in families. I would never have thought that at 14, I was laying my own career path. To give you an idea of the kind of issues I deal with, I want to tell you about an incident I had last year. I was at a conference, and I ran into a colleague of mine. I hadn't seen him in about 20 years, and he asked me what I was working on. And so I said, just like what Chris introduced me, I'm working on gender, work, and family. I just finished a book on globalization. I was just at the UN and talked about this. And he looked at me kind of quizzically, and he said, OK, if you're such an expert on this topic, I have a question for you. And he told me the following story. He had become a contract archaeologist, and he had been working in a village in northern Mexico over the last 15 years. He goes there every summer and does his work there. When he first went to that village, they had a very traditional division of labor. The women would get up at dawn, they would prepare breakfast, they, um, the men would go out work in the fields, then at lunchtime the women would deliver them lunches, at dinner time, the women would prepare dinner. Meanwhile, they had cleaned the house, taken care of the children, you know, the usual domestic tasks. Well, about 10 years ago, a multinational corporation built a factory one and a half hours outside of this village. The next time that my friend down, went down there, his name is Chris, what he found was the women were getting up before dawn. They were still making breakfast. They were packing lunches for their husbands. Then they would all line up, get on a bus, be driven one and a half hours away from their village. They would work a 10-hour shift in the factory. They would come back when it was dark. They would make dinner. They would clean the house. And they would put the kids to bed. And he asked me, are these women better off? Are these families better off? As a cultural anthropologist, what do you think? I can't pass judgment. From a Western perspective, these women are working. They're earning money. They're empowered. But we all know they're working double and triple shifts. Their lives have not necessarily improved. And that is what my work focuses on, how we understand these changes that are happening in families, both in the United States, but as I said, worldwide. I want to start out with the United States. We tend to think we're a very individualistic society. We're free to do whatever it is that we like to do. However, as this 2010 Pew study indicates, most people value their families. Over 75% of people say that the most important relationships they have are their families. And just for the record, we're talking about all kinds of families, not just biologically related people. We're talking about the people who, who you feel intimate with, the people who you have connections to. Again, I'm an anthropologist, and I believe we're hardwired to form close connections to other people. And we traditionally have lived in small groups, no matter how you define those groups. So why, why, do I study about, why do I study families? Why do I talk about families? I feel very strongly that we ignore families. We talk about government. We talk about economics. We talk about globalization. We talk about the role of corporations. But we don't talk about families. We all come from families. We all think we know a lot about families. We either like our families, or we just kind of you know, grin and bear our families. But we tend not to notice them, and we tend not to study them. But families are actually incredibly important because families mediate the relationship between individuals and other institutions in society. And we're going to get back to that. We have several common myths that are pervasive in our society. The first is that families really don't matter that much anymore. I can do whatever it is I like. I'm an individual. Well, you know what? If I get offered a really nice job in California, I don't think I can just say yes to that job. I would have to go home, I would have to convince my husband that there's something in it for him to pack up the family and move to California. 
You know, I would probably discuss it with my parents. My children might have a say in it. They may not want to change schools. You know, and I'd probably discuss it with my close friends. So it's not really true that I'm such an individual making all of my own decisions. The second myth we have is that gender roles are getting, you know, that women have been empowered, gender roles are changing for the better. There was an article in the New York Times last year that really bothered me. The article stated that there are now more women in the US labor force than men. The article made it sound like this was a really good thing. What the article didn't say was there may be more women in the labor force, but these women don't have the kind of jobs that men used to have, jobs that come with retirement benefits, jobs that come with insurance. A lot of these jobs are part-time jobs. So there's a lot of issues around gender that we haven't explored and that we tend to talk about in, in platitudes. The third myth that we have is that there's a homogenization of values going on both in the US and, again, worldwide. This point was brought home to me a couple months ago. I was visiting my brother in New York, and he took me along to a dinner party. It was a very high-end dinner party, you know, lots of people in the financial world. And one of the women had just returned from a business trip to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and to Singapore. And she was talking about the fact that the people who she interacted with, they all had the same espresso maker, they all drove a Mercedes, they all had Prada handbags. And so the dinner conversation revolved around this idea that we've all bought into this consumer culture, we're all sharing in this. And I left the dinner and I kept thinking about this and I kept thinking that it is the smallest percentage of people that are sharing in this consumer culture. Instead, what is happening is that there's greater awareness among different populations about all of these items and, uh, that, that they can, could potentially purchase and have as part of their lives. But most people can never even dream of having any of these things. What, what there is going on is that music is spreading around the world. Uh, people are wearing the same brands of blue jeans, or at least they're aspiring to wear the same brands of blue jeans. What's going on actually is a hybridization of values. So people are taking a little bit from here and there, and they're sort of enfolding it in their local culture. But I would really argue against this homogenization of values. So what is happening from a global perspective? Well, we're growing. We keep growing. There's more and more people in the world. We're at approximately 7 billion people. In 13 years, we're going to hit 8 billion people. But there's a big gap because what's happening in the industrialized world is very different from what's happening in non-Western countries. I don't know how many of you have been to places like Manila or Rio or Mexico City. Those cities are exploding with people. Meanwhile, I go to Europe every year. The fertility rate in many European countries is flat. It's at zero. So there's a redistribution that's going on in terms of the world population. We're becoming more colorful. Look at this. Five out of six people in 13 years are going to be Latin American, African, Asian, or Middle Eastern. Last year in the United States, over 50% of babies born were non-white. So we're in the midst of a radical demographic transition. In just eight years, India is going to have more people than China. And look at this last statistic. Every five days, every five days, there are a million more people moving into cities. I was in Rio last year. When you fly into Rio and you looked at it is an enormous city. I had never pictured as big a city as Rio de Janeiro. And that is just one example of one city in the world. So what's actually happening in families? This is very interesting. Again, this is not just in the United States, but pretty much globally, with a couple of exceptions in other parts of the world. Well, what did men used to look for when they looked for a wife? They used to look for a virgin. They used to look for a woman who would be a good mother and a woman who would keep house nicely. What did, men, uh, what did women look for? Primarily, they looked for a man who would have a good income and who would be relatively easy to live with. <laughs> Today, <laughs> Today, what, what, what is it everybody's looking for? Well, we've had this spread of the notion of romantic love. So increasingly, we look for love and attraction. 
but I warn my female students every semester. I tell them what men look for in a hookup is very different from what men look for in marriage. And increasingly, men want a woman who's going to earn a good income. Men don't want the responsibility anymore of having to pay all the bills. So when a guy is thinking about marrying you, you better have some career plans in your head. What are women looking for? This is very interesting too. Women are looking for a man who wants a family. I was in Buenos Aires, Argentina this week, and on my last night, I went to a really nice, really upscale bar, and I got into a conversation with three women. They were in their mid-30s. And so I asked them, I said, what's it like to be a woman in this beautiful city? And they said, no good. And I said, no good, why? And they said, no men. I said, no men, there's lots of handsome men. I see them everywhere. They're on the street, in the coffee shops. And they said, no, Argentinian men, they only want sex. I said, that's not really atypical, you know? And, <laughs> and they looked at me, <laughs> and they looked at me sadly, and they said, we want children. So, so we're waiting to get married. Again, the age, of, the age at which we get, there's all this publicity that people aren't getting married anymore. That's not true. People are still getting married. In fact, in the United States, we love to get married. We're the only country in the world that has three wedding channels. We have people get married on the Today Show. People love marriage in the United States. But, but, we're older when we get married. So women are 26, men are 27. For example, in Sweden, the average marriage age, men are 35, women are 32. So we're waiting. Why are we waiting? For lots of reasons. Most of them have to do with education, you know, uh, finding a job, saving some money. But we're also very much into self-actualization, into finding ourselves, into figuring out what it is that we want. That's particularly true for people who live in higher socioeconomic contexts. The more money you have, the more freedom you have to quote unquote, find yourself. As I mentioned before, there's a spread of the concept of romantic love. You used to get married because your parents thought this was a good person for you to get married to. You felt obligated to marry this person. Now we want to feel this big zing, you know, when we get married. We've decoupled sexu sexuality from marriage and childbearing. We don't have to, you know, in the past, in order to have sex, you had to get married. Now all you have to do is go to a bar if you really feel like it, you know. <laughs> you can have your children outside of marriage. 42% of children in the United States are born outside of marriage today. 42%. Even 20 years ago, that was an unheard of statistic. So once we're married, we tend to break up. I was just at this conference in Argentina. I was talking to women from Ghana, from Korea, from Japan, from Nigeria. So I like global conferences because you get to talk to people in one room you know, from all these places. And they were all talking about the rising divorce rate in their countries. These are places where there's a really serious stigma attached to being divorced, and yet women are choosing divorce. And by the way, it tends to be women who initiate divorce. Even if a man is unhappy, he will tend to stay in the marriage, but it is women who will push for divorce, not just in the United States. Again, a global phenomenon. Why? Well, increasingly, women are also financially independent. They don't have to stay. If they're not happy in the marriage, they go, and that is happening in other places. The third point is we're constantly being told there are wonderful alternatives out there. I was in California last year, and I saw the most, you know, shock, to me, shocking billboard. The billboard was a woman with a deep cleavage, a guy really muscled, and underneath it, it said, why stay married? It was the advertisement of a divorce lawyer. You know? <laughs> and I thought about that. And I thought, you know, it's this message. We're inundated with these messages. I'm not that happy with my spouse, but I bet there's somebody better out there. So we, without thinking, we sort of take in these messages. I think one of the most important phenomena that's happening, and that's where my research is focused, is around this issue of work and particularly women in the workforce. 
I always say that 100 years from now, when they look back at our society, they're going to say the most important sociological phenomenon was the fact that so many women entered the workforce. And look at these statistics, especially this one right here. 65% of women with preschool children today in the United States are working. This is the group that stayed home. This is the group that always took care of the children. So this this radical change that's happening. And one of the things that really bothers me, though, in the research that's done on this topic is we tend to forget men. Because as women's roles change, men's roles change. Guess who's the most stressed group today in the United States? It's young working fathers because they feel the pressure of maintaining a job while being an involved dad. We used to think that it was women who were the most stressed. Now it is men. Another very interesting statistic, women and men today spend more time with their children than they did in 1965. In fact, for women, it's 21%. So women, working women today are spending more time with their children than stay-at-home mothers did in their 60s. You may ask, in the 1960s, you may ask, how do they do this? Well, they do it by sacrificing time with their spouse and sacrificing personal time. And we also have a new conception of what it is to be a good parent, to be a good mom. So you're probably sitting here thinking these are all very interesting uh, statistics. Why should I care about them? And that's where my research comes in. I feel very strongly that we're in the midst of an incredible social transformation. This social transformation is equivalent to the Industrial Revolution, but it's different again because it's happening very quickly. We feel it. I hear my friends talking all the time. They complain, oh, my kid, he texts at the table. You know? Or I have several friends where their husbands are unemployed and can't find a job, and they're like, what's going on? Where are these jobs? All of these phenomena are interrelated to each other. And so what is happening is we're in the midst of this transformation, and this is a permanent transformation. We're not going back to anything. We're not going back to the sort of mythical leave it to beaver family where mom stayed at home and you know, dad went to work and you had 2.1 kids and a white picket fence. No, the, the transformation that is happening is a radical transformation. It is a permanent transformation, and it is a very quick transformation. It's accelerating. It's speeding up. Look at, look at uh, for example, the phenomenon with Facebook. Facebook. You know, three years ago when I would walk into my classes, hardly any student had a computer. Now I teach a huge class. I walk in, they all have their computers up, they all have Facebook up. You know, so there are these, there are these, and they're interacting with people around the world. Let me give you a very quick example. Our family has, a, has had a series of au pairs. Each of our au pairs keeps a blog about our family in Polish, in Chinese, in Swedish. You know, I don't know what they say. I know we star in the blog, but I don't know what it is they're saying about us. And all of them have hundreds of people following the blogs. So this is incredible change that's going on. Um, the second point I want to make is we tend to think that what happens in families is all individualistic. You know, that's why I showed you the statistics about when we marry and divorce and all that. But the changes happening in families have to do with macro forces, with other forces in society, and they impact what it is that's going on in families. And to me, what I'm trying to do is raise awareness about what is going on so that we can put into place policies and programs that are going to help individuals and families with these new, new, th these new phenomena that have come up. I would like to end with the following quote from an English social philosopher. And he says, among all the changes going on in the world, none is more important than those happening in our personal lives, in sexuality, relationships, marriage, and the family. Thank you.